Well, we're joined now by the chair of the ERG group of Conservative MPs, Mark Francois. Um, first, you should say, you've got a very important role in this uh, with the uh, chair of the group that you represent, Eurosceptic Conservatives. Mm. Now, we haven't seen the deal. No. You haven't seen the deal. No. Uh, we've got a few linked details. What would you make of what we know so far? Well, just, just quickly, the context. This is all about upholding the Good Friday Agreement. That's what everyone is trying to achieve. That's been the bedrock of peace in Northern Ireland for a quarter of a century. And the Prime Minister writing in the Sunday Times this morning said quite rightly that the protocol has now unbalanced the Good Friday Agreement. The late Lord Trimble, a Nobel laureate, he's the man that helped create the Good Friday Agreement with John Hume, said in May 2022, a few months before he sadly died, that he and John Hume had made great sacrifices to bring peace to Northern Ireland, and that was now all at risk. So this has to be solved so that we can uphold the Good Friday Agreement. That is the, that's the imperative. And in order to do that, we have to get a deal that both nationalists and unionists feel comfortable with, because the fundamental underlying principle that runs throughout the Good Friday Agreement like a golden thread is the principle of consent. So that feels important, doesn't it? Because you're Absolutely. talking about the unionists, the DUP, the, yes. U the main unionist party. Are you effectively saying that if they don't support the deal, you're not going to support it either? Well, the government is saying that. The Foreign Secretary said on Friday that um, the government would not sign off on any protocol deal without the DUP's backing. So that's James Cleverly saying that. And I think that's just a practical reality. Because if the DUP don't consent to the deal, then it's simply not going to fly. And, and that's been absolutely obvious right from the word go. Now, the DUP are friends and allies of ourselves and the European Research Group. We admire them. Why? When a lot of these people went into politics, you know, some decades ago, they did that knowing that their lives might be under threat from the provisional IRA, one of the most ruthless terrorist organisations in the world. I mean, so if you, none of your viewers, I'm sure, had to look under their car uh, before they went to work in the week. But the people in the DUP had to do that every day for many years. But they went to work anyway. So the point is, these people won't be bullied by anybody. They will make their own decision on whether or not, or not it's right to agree to the deal and to re-enter Stormont. We know, don't we, what they're going to say. Because they said it on PMQs. They said that we're not going to back a, a deal uh, if the European Courts of Justice have any oversight over it, mm -hmm. which we know effectively that they will, and also that the text itself has to be rewritten. That's also not going to happen. So the DUP aren't going to well, the deal, well, right? Well, the DUP are more than capable of speaking for themselves. They are not shrinking violets. But we can read between the lines of what they're saying. Well, to the, me, it doesn't feel like they're going to back the deal. They have been frighteningly consistent, including to us, that they, their bottom line is they absolutely cannot accept a deal that means EU law is still superior to UK law in Northern Ireland. If there's no EU law in Northern Ireland, that there's nothing for the European Court of Justice to adjudicate upon. Now, we don't know what is in this deal. We haven't seen the legal text. Why does that matter? Because if you're talking about altering protocols or treaties, that always comes down to a definitive legal text. They made very plain that they will not sign up to anything until they've read the legal text. I mean, we are, we're in the same position. What MP worth their salt would vote for something without having read it? So unless that legal text, when we see it, expunges EU law from Northern Ireland, I think it's very unlikely that the DUP will support it, in which case the whole process won't work. I want to talk a bit more about how you yeah. believe you've been treated or let into the process uh, in a moment, but just talking about that EU law, we heard from Dominic Raab, he said, look, if we make the trade easier, then that will mean that there will be less of a role for the... You know, no, less European of a role is not enough. It, so that's not enough, then? No, no, just, just putting a couple of, you know, uh, intermediate phases in, but in a situation where you still end up with the European Court of Justice, is effectively sophistry. I mean, we're not stupid. What we want is a situation where EU law is expunged from Northern Ireland so it is treated on the same basis as England, Scotland and Wales. So any role for the ECJ at all, you're not backing it? Well, 
it does, it, we've left the European Union. It doesn't have that role now in England or in Scotland or in Wales. So if we're going to treat Northern Ireland as an integral part of the United Kingdom, then we have to get rid of EU law in Northern Ireland. We've been absolutely consistent on this. So, in fairness to them, have the DUP. And sometimes we feel like, how many more times do we have to tell the government? But I think what's really interesting is the Foreign Secretary's certainly twigged this, and that's why he said that the government wouldn't sign up to anything that didn't have the DUP's backing. That, to me, is just uh, an acceptance of practical political reality. When were you first asked your opinion? When was the ERG first consulted about this? Well, uh, we've had meetings with, you know, with, with the government ongoing for, for a number of months on this, but what we still haven't seen is a legal text. And I'm sorry to press the matter, but as I hope I've managed to explain, you know, when you're talking about protocols and treaties, the wording matters. Now, interestingly, when you look at the wording of the Good Friday Agreement, and this is a point that a lot of people don't appreciate, sorry, the wording of the protocol, actually, it has in it a clause called Clause 138. And what that says is, any subsequent agreement between the Union and the United Kingdom shall indicate the parts of this protocol which it supersedes, which it goes on to say can be done in whole or in part. So the protocol contained within it the seeds for it to be replaced. It was always meant to be a temporary arrangement, whereas the Good Friday Agreement was meant to be permanent. So with it, using 13.8, you can amend or even get rid of the protocol if you can come up with a better way of doing this. And for two years, we've consistently advocated a different system, which is known as mutual enforcement. Do you feel like there's been a bit of political naivety from the government on this? You, know, you haven't seen the legal text. They haven't brought the DUP on the side. There are reports in the papers this morning that there was a bit of a disagreement, shall we say, between Rishi Sunak and the DUP when they went to Northern Ireland. Do you think they've gone away? You know, they've done the homework. They've answered the essay question in the way that they think they've wanted to, but they haven't done the political well, I think it was someone side. in the DUP who a couple of days ago said, this is a, or in terms, this is a very odd way of going about it. We're the people they ultimately need to convince, and they haven't even shown us the text. So at some point they're going to have to fess up this text and then members of parliament are going to want to, you know, go through it in fine detail and decide whether or not to support it. I'm in the unusual position this morning of agreeing with David Lammy <laughs> in that he just said on your programme a few minutes ago, parliament should not be rushed. I mean, my, if I were advising the prime minister, my honest advice to him would be don't try and bounce parliament next week because that is likely to go badly wrong. If you look at all the history of this, which is complex, trying to bounce Parliament usually ends badly. So if they do want, if they've got a deal they're proud of, show us the text, let us run it by our lawyers, let us fully understand what it means, and then at that point we might be ready to vote on it. But, but it would be a very bad idea. You say that yeah. you're talking about a vote there. Yeah. There might not even be a vote, right? Well, if you're, look, if you're going to make any meaningful changes to the protocol, you're going to have to have a bill. So that's going to mean at some point you're going to have to have a vote. I think given all the history of this, for the government to try and bludgeon this through the House of Commons without a vote of any kind would be incredibly unwise. Why? And I say that as someone who was years ago a senior whip myself. Rishi Sunak's position is already pretty precarious, right? The polls are appalling for the Conservatives. You've got a divided party. If this goes wrong for Rishi Sunak and he can't get it through, do you think that's the beginning and the end? Look, we want the Prime Minister to succeed. We want him to come up with a deal that everybody can support. So, but in order to do that, it's going to have to be a deal that gets rid of EU law. Look, let me try and put it like this. Ultimately, this isn't about red lanes or green lanes or cycle lanes. It's about who governs. It's about whose law is sovereign in Northern Ireland, legally, whose writ runs. And we need, in order to solve this problem and to uphold the Good Friday Agreement and to stop us going backwards in Northern Ireland, which absolutely nobody wants to see, 
we need to get rid of EU law in Northern Ireland. And that's what our negotiators have got to press for. And if they can't get it, then we need to use the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which is currently stalled in the Lords, in order to achieve that aim. We've got the Protocol Bill there ready to go. It, it flew through the Commons. Okay. It's stuck in the Lords. And if the Lords... We should reintroduce it. And if the Lords try to gut the bill, we should Parliament act it. OK. Thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Mark Thank you for having me on. There.